Welcome to season two of Services Marketing. We're now in week seven, it's phase two, and the first of the virtual lectures takes effect, namely this one. We're gonna cover chapters seven and eight in the lecture this evening, this afternoon, or whenever you happen to be listening to it. So, without further ado, what we're gonna deal with is Common strategy and service scape. Common strategy in services marketing is a little more complicated than we may be used to engaging in conventional marketing because you do suddenly find yourself with a bunch of other difficulties and annoyances that you have to engage. But you also have a couple of advantages and assets that you don't normally get uh, inside services that you compare to when you're playing with goods. So, Let's dive in and cover some of the fundamentals. So, first and foremost, the services communication strategy is not terribly far removed from classic goods-based marketing communication strategy. Your key opening is the selection of target markets. But what this raises is an interesting concept, is that this opens up the seduction model and other customers. So for all of you who rated other customers as the lowest priority in the seduction model, target markets are the other customers. So now we've got a little something here to consider is that what we're looking for is who we're going to talk to, how we're going to talk to them, what the message is going to be, and how we're going to deliver it. So key here is that what uh, we're also going to pick up is a little bit of strategy. So for those of you done or about to do or doing marketing strategy, depending on where the service product is in the product lifecycle for that audience depends on your communications objectives. So if you are starting proceedings, you're just uh, introducing a new product, then you're going to need to be more informational than you'll need to be persuasive. If the product already exists and you're in a growth or maturity market, then you're going to have to explain what your product does, but also why your product is better. Finally, if you're in maturity and decline, you're about persuasion and you're about reminding people to be involved. One of the aspects to services marketing is getting people to repeat a service, to come back. Uh, because services are co-produced, the better someone gets at a service, the easier it is for them to get the most out of the service. But they also need to be encouraged and persuaded to be, to recommit, to re-engage because once you teach someone how to self-service and co-produce enough, they may fall into a self-service pattern. So a couple of the basics, fundamentals back in play, smart objectives are always in effect. Uh, if you're doing comms in marketing, you're using smart objectives. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-bound. The R changes on a regular basis, relevant, realistic, reasonable, at the end of the day, you should be able to track what is the plan, when is it going to happen, and what are we going to do to get there, and how will we know that we've achieved it. So pulling into the differentiation strategies, one of the things that you want to be considering here is that because services are intangible, you're going to start relying on certain points of differentiation, one of which is another aspect of the services marketing mix. You can work with personnel differentiation. So the four, in the four Ps, you've got price, you've got product, you've got promotion, you've got place. Product differentiation is a routine one that we're used to doing. Image differentiation is all about the brand, the simmer, the synergy between symbols, uh, images, implied message, implied promise. 
But when we pull up the other three elements, the marketing mix for services, and you get promotion, a top promotion, you get people, physical evidence, and processes, you see that people and physical evidence show up in personnel differentiation and image differentiation. So there are a few ways in which we can use extra parts of services marketing, particularly the idea of the effective personnel differentiation. Who is it who works for our service? How does that make our service a better option? So a couple of things on services marketing that we're used to doing. Uh, promises in the services are important. Uh, we're talking about the expectations, the management of expectations. So when you are communicating a service, you need to ensure that you promise what is possible, even if there is a temptation and a desire to promise beyond the possible, keep it in check. Uh, in marketing, there is such a concept as uh, mere fluff. It's a legal concept where you promise beyond what is possible, but everyone agrees that, oh yeah, that was never realistic. My preference is to promise what can be done. But the challenge is, if you are promising the intangible, which is an experiential process, how do you communicate it? The other component in here that's uh, worth mentioning is feature the ideal customer type. So using the seduction model again, place the advertising inside the service scape, place the advertising with service personnel and with the ideal type of service customer candidate. Who is it you want to have in your service environment? Who do you want to, as a customer, feature them in your advertising? Uh, the other things in terms of services communication, basically what you're looking for is to explain. You are looking to focus on key elements and again, this is going to be about your decision of what is it that we are going to emphasize. Are we going to emphasize the outcome, the friendliness, the speed, the efficiency? What are the intangibles do we try to tangibilize? How do we make it? How do we pitch this thing so that people understand it and want to be involved in it? So a couple of things in terms of the uh, communication strategies, elements, the challenges. Basically what you're looking in here is the, uh, a list of possible things that you want to engage with when you're trying to come up with your strategy, things you have to worry about. And a couple of these that I want to uh, mention just on the way past the rest are in the book, give them a read, is if you are running solo or startup, point seven, the challenge of dividing between your time of delivering service and your time of recruiting new clients. This is a critical balance. You need to be making enough sales to warrant paying the bills, but you need to be investing enough time in the sales and selling process to get those clients so you've got something deliverable. It is one of the big challenges that you'll face, particularly as a uh, startup, as a contractor, as a consultant, balancing between I've got to go out and deliver and I've got to go out and sell. Particularly if you get a peak period of activity, you still need to be recruiting for the next window whilst you're delivering. So, services communication. Uh, before I go into chapter eight and Service scape. The thing with service communication to remember is that you are still one element of the marketing mix that has to fit with the rest of the mix. And in doing so, when I bring up delivery and service scape and physical evidence as a combined area. So we often do promotion and service scape hand in hand because the pair of them draw heavily on each other. Physical evidence is one of the elements of the extended uh, services marketing mix, and it's important because we have a couple of big ticket theories that
that we use to drive our decision making. And it's also important because the physical evidence is linked to product, it's linked to promotion, and it's also linked to service personnel. So we have aspects like the physical environment we're going to have people working in, the uniforms they're going to be wearing, this will impact on how your service personnel will engage and will want to deal with the customer. Simultaneously, how the customer interacts and engages inside the service scape environment will impact both on perceptions of quality and on how they are going to interact with other customers, with the service providers, and the service itself. So you have a whole series of interplay interaction effects going on that in this point we're going to showcase some of them and some of the ways in which you can engage with this content and engage with these concepts. So let's kick this off. Physical evidence, exterior, interior, offer. Obviously, physical evidence is going to be determined as per the service that's being offered. A mechanics has a very different physical service scape to a lawyer, to an advertising agency. Ironically, a mechanics and a hairdresser is probably the closest in uh, physical scape I could think of off the top of my head because you would be looking at an environment in which the tools and the physical elements are indicative of both the processes that are available and the service quality. You walk into a mechanics, it's absolutely spotlessly clean. If you're not expecting high-end European sports car at that point, you're probably getting nervous. You walk into a mechanics and there are parts of cars everywhere, but the, clearly they've got it under control. It's got the sort of home garage, back shed type of feel. You're expecting friendly, possibly a lower price, but you're definitely going to get two different impressions from walking into somewhere that looks like it could be a doctor's surgery versus somewhere that looks like it could be your mate's garage. So, in terms of uh, the, the big idea paper, if we go back to Bittner's 92 paper, this is the big ticket event. It brings up service scape, it brings up its impact. Your two keys here are how much physical evidence is in place, how well it's used to communicate. So you walk into certain service environments, you are basically going to be engaging a kiosk, a front counter, and under the service blueprint, everything else is going to be invisible and behind the scenes. Limited physical evidence. So you're gonna use uniforms, shop fronts, other cues. You walk into somewhere like a resort, like a park, uh, a shopping complex, somewhere where experiential outcomes are expected, there will be extensive physical evidence. The physical evidence might be the bulk of the service experience, but they're also an aspect of you're going to need the tangible to create the intangible. You go to a theme park, the people in the costumes, the events, the venues, the roller coaster, all of these things are physical items that will create the intangible experience that you're paying the money for. You're not paying the money to own the roller coaster, you're paying the money for the experience, the physical sensory experience that comes from taking that ride. So, in physical evidence, we are playing back into some of the stuff we would see in the extended product model. You do need to look at your core actual and augmented product framework to see what is it that's going to be useful. You're also going to look at this from the point of view of what level do I want to balance intangibility? To what extent do I want to make intangibility my feature? Reduce the physical evidence. What extent do I want to make it my, uh, I want to remove it, I want to downplay it. 
massively increase the physical evidence. So you're looking at this around service packaging. You're also looking at the possibility of using post-service queues, where the service itself is intangible, but the post-service, the receipt, the bill, the follow-up, physical objects that are given to you as reminders of you have, reminders that are designed to set off your consumer behavior process and nullify your cognitive dissonance by going, that was a good service experience. Look, I've got this physical object to prove it. Other aspects to what's gonna happen in uh, the physical environment, physical evidence, uh, the flow of the service delivery process. We're now linking back into the service blueprint. The socialization of customers, employees, pulling up seduction, other customers, and points of differentiation. Service scapes probably are the one point in the service framework that you'd best be able to get away with uh, engaging patents, lawyers, and copyright. So physical evidence will be useful to create an environment in which the service can be protected and differentiated. So in terms of packaging, think like a physical goods marketer for a moment and think about what packaging conveys. Because packaging conveys prompts, it conveys cues, it indicates to people, hey, this is what I should expect. The same process happens in the physical evidence. If we take something like the hairdressing salon, you walk in, there are mirrors everywhere. There are chairs. There are a variety of custom looking chair devices that have things attached to them. And there are people sitting under those, on those chairs, under those things, clearly experiencing a service. There's a lot of physical evidence that says this hairdressing salon knows what it's doing. So that evidence will set off quality cues. Those quality cues will help the customer determine uh, their impression and that will help the image development and the image management. So the couple of things that will happen here is that uh, the reason why you had a question on why does the service scape uh, in, or why and how do disconfirmation expectations and service scape work together is because it's priming you for thinking about this when you walk into a service what is my response? What is my reaction? You walk into a dry cleaners and you can see a line of very well presented clean clothes, either fresh off the rack or just nicely done up. That's going to reassure you that, hey, these people have got it. If you were to walk into the same dry cleaners and see a pile of clothes just flung about the place like it was laundry day down at the college, you would probably feel greater doubts about leaving your stuff here. You'd be like, I'm not sure about this. Similarly, laundrettes that have piles of unsorted clothing, not confidence inducing, have piles of clean clothing, even if they're just there as props, they are going to give you a quality cue and going to help you develop, okay, this is my expectation. The other thing about service is the service plays a role on the way in. You walk into a service environment, you're getting your cues, you're getting your expectations. But you're also getting your cues on the way out and on the way past. So you go to a service, you head into the uh, dental clinic, you're greeted by the reception, everything's yeah, you know, nice and bright and clean and reassuring. Everyone's professional, everyone's in uniform. You go off, you get your dental work done. You just come out with a face full of uh, pain suppressants, bunch of dental work's taken place. And the team at the reception pretty much is doing, not quite doing everything in sign language, but minimizing the amount of talk that is required. You're gonna feel that little extra gratitude because on the way out, the cognitive distance of, I can't speak, why, I, why am I being asked complicated questions? They should know, because they're about to run up the bill about what's happened to me, why, are you, why is this happening? 
if we flip this around as well and then do this as the exit when you are leaving, how are you treated on the way out? How is the final bill managed? Is it professional? Are the payments easy? Are there any problems in terms of coming to the final tallies and totals? Reduction of cognitive dissonance takes place within the service scape environment, but also in things like, do you get a, you've gone to an expensive service, uh, you've asked for a, you've asked for legal advice, do they present you a nice little envelope and folder that has your information in it, it's crisply printed, so you feel that you've got good information. All of this packaging is around playing to the consumer behavior it triggers, but also ultimately, because the service is hard to determine, these help the customer feeling that their needs have been met. So in terms of facilitating the service process, a couple of things, uh, the, there are a couple of roles. One of them is, how do I act? The ServiceScape has a whole set of training and learning exercise elements. You walk into a new environment, new service encounter, you haven't been to before, you start looking around, you're looking for, is there somewhere a queue up? Is there a sign? Can I tell who the staff are? What is my role in this environment? Do I wait to be seated? Do I take my own seat? How does it work? So quite often, depending on the complexity of the service process, there may be physical designs of arrows. The carpet has pathways. You are pointed from desks with numbers. You are given a, you go into the bank, you queue up, you meet a machine at the front of the bank that asks you what is your plan for your transactions today? Why are you here? You punch in the requirements, press the things on the touch screen. It prints you a little note and the note will then tell you, go to this part of the service scape, await this service provider. So it's teaching you, it's providing you, it's facilitating the ordering. You're also looking at this from the point of view of how does the customer engage with the service? Does the service environment have elements where the customer in co-production needs to participate? Is the capacity there for customers to participate or to be queuing? And also separating customers from customers. You go into a service encounter uh, you're at a hairdressing salon, yeah, you're probably okay with sitting side by side with half a dozen other people and having a bit of a chat about the sport, the weather and the local news. If you've gone off to get a get dental work done, you're probably going to want your own private room. Uh, if you're getting the more medical or more personal or private the service, the more likely it is to be served in single single customer servings. You can just imagine a dental salon where everybody sits down in the same way that they do at hair salons. It doesn't feel right, much in the same way that if you were to walk into a hairdresser's and be ushered into a private room and the door is sealed shut, questions are going to be raised. So these are some of the aspects in terms of also setting expectations. When we start to talk to these elements, you can start to visualize ideal service scape environments. And socialising of employees and customers, get uniforms. Uh, so the one thing I'm going to say is uniforms are really super useful because they will point out who the employee is. If you get a uniform and make use of the uniform in your service provision, it will also help from the employee's point of view of very clear guidance around what's appropriate to wear, what's uh, with on brand, on integrated marketing communication, on signs, symbols, and artifacts saying, this is who I am, this is what I do. And also, at the end of the day, you're providing a service environment. If you're expecting your employees to have to spend a chunk of their wage buying their own clothes to fit your environment, then you're outsourcing mission critical parts to the budget that you're probably not providing enough for them to pay. If you're gonna get them to buy their own stuff, then you're also not completely in control of your service environment. 
what your employee wears to work is going to, if it's their budget and their wardrobe that you're tapping into, you're effectively, you're outsourcing that aspect, but also you're cheaping out in an area that you should be putting under control. So get uniforms. They work, they're useful, they have a role, they have a value. And in particular, a uniform and uniform requirements will very quickly tell you whether you've got a socialization problem in your network of who do I expect to be my staff member? If I've gone out and said, oh, I've just ordered a bunch of uniforms, they are all the one gender, they're all the one size, they're all the, okay, I haven't thought about the diversity of my employees. If everyone's expected to be walking around the place with items that they're going to need to carry, then we're going to need uniforms with pockets. If their pockets are hard to acquire on certain uniforms, then we need to ensure that that is dealt with, that the, our staff outfits and uniforms help facilitate the delivery of the service. Now, certain areas, uh, some things in terms of uh, hairdressers and butchers come to mind immediately, as do chefs. You have equipment, personal equipment, that you would want to use with you. Uh, all chefs have their own set of chef knives that they're very fussy about, justifiably so, because they're trait equipment. You can find a balance between the employee wants their own trade equipment and the uniforms that you provide need to be able to support that trade equipment. Now, excluding all the things on this page, upgrade the, just stick to the uniforms. Well-dressed personnel are perceived as, look, this is a whole bunch of social cognitive bias and I'm willing to bet that a bunch of the research underneath this also has a lot of unquestioned assumptions around orthodoxies of better dressed, aka more standardized white male middle class Western uniform outfit. Be mindful of these things. Be aware that uh, stereotypes exist in research. Challenging question. But also with uniforms, the other thing about them is you can provide them to your staff en masse and they are part of your branding. All right, let's look a little bit about how the, the framework works. Stimulus organi organism response. The classic model, the classic, it comes out of CB, you would have first met it there. Everything in terms of engaging with an environment comes down to something or someone interacts with the stimuli and you get a set of responses from that person, thing or object. So the it's good to see the Donovan and uh, Rossiter model, two Australian authors in play here. Uh, Rossiter's out of University of Wollongong and Donovan's out of University of West Australia. I think it's Curtin possibly. Uh, fundamentally, what you're looking at is an emotional response to environmental stimuli that will result in approach or avoidance. If something is pleasurable, it will increase the level of approach. If something is not pleasurable, you will desire to avoid. The arousal is fight or flight, it's heart rate up. That's variable in terms of approach and avoid, as is the final factor when you're looking at what is it going to go to make someone, in terms of a stimulus organism response, when I create my shop front, when I create my service scape, will it draw the right people towards it? Will it cause the wrong customer to feel, I don't want to engage? So the key about this, again, is what you're looking for is the service scape and the physical evidence supports the seduction model by selecting the right type of customer, which will influence the other customers. The dominance uh, submissiveness is also a case of, do we want, do we set an environment where people will want to assert themselves over their environment, or do we set an environment where the environment asserts itself over the people? There's a lot of weird stuff in services marketing. This is one of those ones. Uh, we start thinking about things like gyms. 
and training routines and personal fitness and the Tough Mudder contest. Dominant submissiveness suddenly makes sense. I'm going to be in pain. I'm going to be decidedly displeased by this entire encounter because so much mud, so much war, cold, so much pain. But if I can beat this thing, I will have a pride. And that third point, it's all avoidant behavior. It's all in a, a landscape that should be all triggering the avoidance. If you can master and overcome that avoidance to get through it, then you're going to have sufficient reward to make up for all the costs, psychic costs you just paid. All right, service escapes, physical evidence uh, for service environments. Massive, massive area to work with, uh, both in terms of being a consumer, being aware and, and having the mindfulness of what is, in, what is happening in your environment, in your physical locations, and to be aware of how those locations can cause you to react. So the Mary Jo Bittner, the 92 hour article, it's worth going and reading the whole thing through because it is such a significant and impactful part of marketing theory. Basically what you're looking for is, or looking to take out of this, is that the service scape impacts on your customer and on your employee. Subduction model, other customers, subduction model, employees, subduction model, service scape, and subduction model, internal processes. So for the employees, can they do the job you're asking them to do in the environment that you're putting them in without pain, discomfort, is there a physical fit to the environment? Do they, will being in this environment be conducive to them doing their job for an extended period? Things like theme parks, uh, now I can speak to the Hotel Legoland at Windsor, UK. The lift plays exactly the same message every time it arrives in the lobby area and it arrives in the lobby area quite frequently during the busy periods and it has never changed in the seven years that it has been operating so the staff once every three or four minutes will hear the same blast of message which to the child who first encounters it is super exciting to the employee who's on their seventh year and n thousandth encounter, it's super irritating. So you've got a balance between what does the customer, the customer's experience, something that's going to be short, it wears off quickly, but gives an initial spike of positivity to the customer, should possibly be placed in locations that will be infrequently accessed by the employee. So this is one of these, uh, the model here, its point and purpose is for you to be able to engage it, read it, and then look to the world to see it contextualized. Give the original reading, give the original bit and a uh, look over, then go back outside, go encounter a couple of services. It's a good one for benchmarking as well. How does the physical environment engage the customer would it be different for the employee? Again, um, a lot of what we do in the services marketing is all continuum based. So self-service, remote service, and interpersonal service. Basically, who's gonna use the facility that will also determine who's the priority in terms of what is the service scape designed for. So let's talk about individual components, the physical environment elements, the ambient conditions, I kind of find it entertaining to do servicescape via virtual and video lectures uh, rather than have to stand in a lecture theatre and be in each box of the servicescape. What you're looking for here is to start with, you want to say, okay, how, what's the lighting like? What's the air, noise, music, odour? Odor is a really interesting one if you've ever walked through Lush. 
because it's also something you can sell. Each of these factors is something where you want to make a deliberate design choice. Darkened, noisy, smoke-filled, loud. People are going to pay $175 for that ticket to that concert. Brightly lit, quiet, slight hint of incense. That yoga class, also 175 bucks. So each thing needs to have a decision made. It always needs to be deliberate. Pro and con is how well it aligns to the service offering the overall product and what you're trying to achieve. For space and function, layout, the way in which, and there's a lot of work that's been done on queuing processes, on structures. You walk into an environment, can you automatically determine where you should be going for your next part of the performance of the service? Sign symbols, artifacts, uh, these are also uh, important because these are tangibilizations of the service message, of the impression that you're trying to create. Anyone who ever walks into my office will encounter that the ambient conditions, it's always kept on Queensland, the noise varies, the space and function is designed for me, priority one, for the visiting guest, priority two, but the signs, symbols and artifacts are expressly designed to distract anyone who walks into the room. There should be something that will catch your eye, draw your attention and bring your focus to that and then you have to bring your focus back to me. It is built with intention. Everything that's in there is aimed to create an, a message, a distract message. Stage two, the collective perception. Again, once you start looking at this, there are component parts to engage. But overall, what you're looking for is to understand how do I use all of the previous components to create a perception, an overall perception. Because what you're looking for then is that perception is designed to help you set off part of the stimulus organism response model. You want people to have a response or a reaction. Now, one of the things that is going to influence the heterogeneity of your service environments is people vary. One of the aspects to the maintenance of my office as a point of distraction is 12 years and approximately 10 kilos of artifacts, objects and other elements have been throughputed through the office to change it where I know people are going to repeatedly appear. It gets rebuilt and modified so that there is always something new so that we don't have a learning effect in the environment. Similarly, customer who is completely fired up and excited and looking forward to an event is going to have a different engagement in terms of the uh, three basic emotional states in contrast to someone perhaps reluctant, resistant, or just straight up on neutral. So this is one of the facets here of heterogeneity is the customer will vary and how they are feeling before they engage with the service environment. Finally, almost finally, stage four, the internal responses. This is an important factor because what you're now looking at is the outcome of the service scope. What are the responses to being in this environment? Pain is a factor in service scape. If you have to queue for an extended period, there is physical discomfort that will occur. The chairs are awkward, the seats are awkward, things are uncomfortable. You've gone to see a movie, it's three hours, it's Lord of the Rings, extended edition. You've queued for three, hour, three and a half hours, you've sat down for four hours, you're seven hours into the experience. There will be discomfort, there'll be physiological responses. Similarly, Flashing lights, strobes, smoke machines, 
ambient environment events that are designed to create a specific type of reaction can create pain and discomfort, both for, employer, for customers as temporary participants going through, but also for employees as permanent people inside these high sensory environments. Other internal responses, we're looking at the cognitive response where you learn how to engage the service and the emotive response where you are getting your physical, the combination of your physical and cognitive and emotive reactions, pleasure, happiness, displeasure, avoid approach. So again, the service scapes point is it's a physical, tangible manifestation of the service designed to create an internal, intangible response in the customer, which results in the behavioral outcomes. So avoidance, people don't want to do this again, or approach, people want to do this again, they want to spend more time there, they want to spend more money there. The number of people who went through a horror uh, movie event and went, that was Awesome, I have never been so scared in my life. Let's do it again. The approach behaviors here are all about increasing loyalty, increasing repeat custom. Think in terms um, of your ANSOF matrices as well, in terms of repeat custom, selling the same thing to the same person. And because we are capable of customization, we can sell to the same customer a new experience in the same environment. Avoidance behaviors, by the way, are not a bad thing. They need to be a deliberate thing. If you ever walked into a venue and gone, yeah, I don't think I'm in the right age bracket for this, and walked out, that's an avoidance behavior. You have self-selected out of the target market. If your market, if you have a distinct target market, and that target market has clear approach behaviors, which are also going to be contrary avoidance behaviors to the target market you don't want, then an avoidance behavior is a positive outcome. You're not getting the wrong customer into the customer mix. So you go into a nightclub, it is all country and Western, and there is enough. It looks like a farmer's reunion and the National Party headquarters rolled into one with a couple of trucks on the side. Chances are the music is going to indicate the type of clientele, the fashion, the elements, all these component parts. If that's not your scene, you're not walking in there. If you have walked in there, you're not staying. Your avoidance behavior helps you self-select out of being the wrong type of other customer. And this is what we come down to of why in the seduction model, other customers could have been your first pick important because your question then becomes who is my target market who is not my target market what does my target market want from the service experience what can I do to block the wrong market in the same way that I encourage the right market so sensory management experience management all these elements flow in together in your service scape to address the five questions and this is why Service scapes are not good or bad. They're aligned well or they're aligned poorly because you've got a target market in mind. Are you meeting that target market's desires, wants and needs in the service experience through your physical environment? So picking off a couple of things on the way to the end, the side appeals, again, visual, uh, one of the things about visual architecture is to also be thinking about non-visual in the respect of can you repeat, can you alternate, can you substitute for, for anyone, any, uh, any members of your target market who would not be able to respond uh, to visual stimuli. Colour perceptions, I'm just going to draw attention to the fact that these are also culturally uh, connected. So be aware of that, be mindful of that, that colors have context and cultural context. So what a color means is not universal, no matter what we 
try and say in the textbooks. Sound appeals. There's a couple of elements here. Uh, if you've ever had to hear the travelator message more than three times whilst travelling on the travelator, uh, customers are reminded to please hold the handrail whilst on the travelator. If the travelator takes 15 seconds and this message is repeated three times, it's possibly too often. But that the use of sound as a factor, as a medium, as a component, it should be built in. But you're also looking at things like ambient sound, noise levels. Is your target audience going to want high noise, low noise, high distraction, low distraction? Is noise part of the feature, engaging in it, creating it? Is noise a cost to be overcome? Again, the service scape decisions here are based around what is my product offer? What is the value proposition I'm creating? How can I use this? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So, pick, picking up our uh, uh, tonight on service interruptions. There is also uh, the other elements here that we're playing into uh, in terms of manipulations. Uh, it's always worth looking into this stuff because we have done a bunch of different manipulations in place, uh, particularly around the idea. IKEA also uses this process to accelerate people through when there are crowds and to slow people down when there are less people in the environment. So what you ultimately have is you've got an IKEA has a, effectively has a DJ whose job it is is to maintain an optimal level of people inside the servicecape environment. And you thought there was no future for your music career. Okay, sound appeals, pleasurable and not pleasurable are subjective. There are certainly elements where Depending on what you're trying to create as your environment depends on what you want the environment to smell like. What's also important to remember is that sensory scent can be one of the uh, a sensory over trigger. Uh, there can be elements where it causes problems for individuals at a physical level, at uh, uh, a physiological response as well as a psychological response. So be mindful, be aware. It's an area where we've seen it tailor back a lot because there have been um, increased levels of awareness and understanding that basically allergens and physical responses triggered by environmental smells are non-conducive to approach behaviours, aka if I have to get a migraine every time I need to shop with you, I'm not going to shop with you anymore. Final uh, elements on the uh, things, physical engagement with the objects, with the items, with the artifacts. Uh, this one as well, a bunch of the, the theory underneath the hood here is going to be subjective. The extent to which you can physically influence part of the artifacts, part of the environment that you can Hold a proxy for the service experience in order to engage uh, the vicarious service engagement. Taste appeals, that should only apply where food is being sold. And finally, closing up on this, there the two elements that are in play here, the two chapters, promotion and service scape, they are linked because Artifacts, messages, and images are created together. Service scapes rely on artifacts, images, messaging, and service scapes need to be aligned with your promotional mix as part of your integrated marketing communication. And your IMC needs to promise the service scape to your potential participants.